In this video, we'll be discussing Euroflowimetry, also known as Euroflow. Euroflow, simply put, is a way to measure the rate of urine flow over time. It's a simple and non-invasive way to assess the bladder's ability to empty, and it's performed with the patient voiding spontaneously into a calibrated recording device. It's often paired with the post-void residual. The setup for Euroflow does not need to be elaborate. The instrument should be in a clean, quiet, and lockable room. Generally, women will perform this while seated, while the majority of men will avoid standing up through a funnel. The chair can be as simple as a commode or advanced as an electromechanical device, such as those that we see in multi-channel urodynamics. There are a number of different methods that can be used to determine the urine flow rate. Here are three of the most common devices. The first is the weight or load cell approach. Basically, the voided weight is measured and then it's calculated with respect to time to determine the flow rate. In the rotating disc approach, as the urine stream is directed onto a rotating disc, the power necessary to keep that disc rotating at a constant rate is measured. This power is proportional to the flow rate. Finally, there is the electrical capacitance method. This flow emitter measures the electrical capacitance of a dipstick that is mounted into the collecting chamber. The output of the signal is proportional to the accumulated volume, and the volumetric flow rate is then determined by differentiation. There are a number of things we can do to ensure that our Euroflow study is adequate. One, we can optimize patient comfort and reduce their anxiety by allowing them to perform their void in their preferred position, whether that be sitting or standing. The voided volume should at least be over 150 milliliters and ideally less than 400 or 500 milliliters as the detrusor muscle may become overstretched and contractility may decrease consequently, creating a false result. And lastly, we should ask if the urine flow they gave was representative of what occurs during non-testing conditions of daily living. Here is the axis that the Euroflow curve is generated on. On the y-axis, we see flow rate in milliliters per second, and then on the x-axis, we see time in seconds. When the patient voids, this curve will be generated. Underneath the area of the curve, we will find the total voided volume. At the apex of the curve, we find the maximum flow rate, or the Qmax, and then there is also a calculation for the average flow rate. Other parameters include the flow time, which is a recording of the total time the patient was actually voiding, as well as the time to maximum flow, which in a normal Euroflow occurs within the first third of the flow time. So what exactly is a normal flow rate or Qmax? Well, flow rate is determined by a number of factors, including age, sex, and voided volume. In males with no bladder outlet obstruction, the value of Qmax tends to decrease with age. Men under 40 will have a value typically over 25 milliliters per second, whereas men over 60 should have a value over 15 milliliters per second. In women, the flow rate is higher than in men by the order of 5 to 10 milliliters for a given bladder volume due to the simplified anatomy of the female urethra. Here are the features of a normal Euroflow curve. It's continuous and bell-shaped. It has a sharp, uprise to the maximum flow rate occurring within the first one-third of the flow time, and then it has a rapid decline with a sharp tail. Let's review some of the abnormal flow curves one might see on a Euroflow. The first is a compressive curve in which the Qmax may not be quite as high and it has a long, prolonged tail, such as what we might see in benign prosthetic obstruction. A constrictive curve is often seen in urethral stricture, where you get this classic box-like appearance after a plateau is reached for the duration of the void. 
The supervoider curve is typically seen in women, often with some sort of detrusor overactivity or stress urinary incontinence, where you see a rapid and high Qmax and then a rapid off. Finally, this last curve is representative of detrusor underactivity. In a patient with some sort of neurologic abnormality, this sawtooth pattern can represent detrusor sphincter dyssynergia, whereby during the contraction of the detrusor, the external sphincter shows involuntary contractions. In patients without any neurologic abnormality, this similar pattern can be seen in patients with anxiety or a history of dysfunctional voiding. Lastly, in patients with a hypoactive or areflexic bladder, you can see this interrupted start and stop pattern that is common in valsalva voiding. There are a number of advantages and disadvantages to be aware of with Euroflow. It's an excellent non-invasive screening test, especially when paired with PBR. In adult men whose Qmax is below or equal to 10, the Euroflow has a specificity of about 70 to 90% with a positive predictive value of 70% in its ability to diagnose obstruction. By itself, Euroflow is unable to discriminate between an obstruction or detrusor hypocontractility, and to get that answer, a pressure flow urodynamics will need to be performed. Lastly, it can be used as a measure of progression of a disease or its response to treatment. That's it for this episode. Thanks for watching.